Excellencies, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, the fourth plenary meeting of the General Assembly is called to order. Delegates are kindly requested to take their seats. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the fourth meeting of the General Assembly is called to order. Before proceeding further, I would like to remind members that masks are to be worn by the attendees at all times when indoors, except when directly addressing the meeting. Due to the temporary closure of the east side emergency doors, in the event of fire or an emergency which requires an evacuation, please use the west, west side emergency doors and the stairway next to the elevator banks. Those in the third and fourth balconies, please use the stairway next to the elevator banks. Before proceeding to the general debate, as announced in the journal, the General Assembly will hear an introduction by the Secretary General of his annual report on the work of the organization under agenda item 113 in accordance with the resolution 51-241 and notwithstanding of provisions in decision 77-241. 504. We shall proceed accordingly. <clears throat> now I give the floor to the Secretary General of the United Nations, His Excellency Mr. Antonio Guterres. Mr. President of the General Assembly, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, our world is in big trouble. Divides are growing deeper, inequalities are growing wider, and challenges are spreading farther. But as we come together in a world teeming with turmoil, an image of promise and hope comes to my mind. This ship is the brave commander. It sailed the Black Sea with the UN flag flying high and proud. On one hand, what you see is a vessel like any other plying the seas. But look closer. At its essence, this ship is a symbol of what we can accomplish when we act together. It is loaded with Ukrainian grain destined for the people of the Horn of Africa millions of whom are on the edge of famine. It navigated through a war zone, guided by the very parties to the conflict, as part of an unprecedented comprehensive initiative to get more food and fertilizer out of Ukraine and Russia, to bring desperately needed relief to those in need, to calm commodity markets, secure future harvests, and lower prices for consumers everywhere. Ukraine and the Russian Federation, with the support of Turkey, came together to make it happen, despite the enormous complexities, the naysayers, and even the hell of war. Some might call it a miracle on the sea. 
In truth, it is multilateral diplomacy in action. The Black Sea Grain Initiative has opened the pathway for the safe navigation of dozens of ships filled with much needed food supplies. But each ship is also carrying one of today's rarest commodities, hope. Excellencies, we need hope, and more, we need action. To ease the global food crisis, we now must urgently address the global fertilizer market crunch. This year, the world has enough food. The problem is distribution. But if the fertilizer market is not stabilized, next year's problem might be food supply itself. We already have reports of farmers in West Africa and beyond cultivating fewer crops because of the price or lack of availability of fertilizers. It is essential to continue removing all remaining obstacles to the export of Russian fertilizers and their ingredients, including ammonia. These products are not subject to sanctions and will keep up our efforts to eliminate indirect effects. Another major concern is the impact of high gas prices on the production of nitrogen fertilizers, and these must also be addressed seriously. Without action now, the global fertilizer shortage will quickly morph into a global food shortage. Excellencies, we need action across the board. Let's have no illusions. We are in rough seas. A winter of global discontent is on the horizon. A cost of living crisis is raging. Trust is crumbling. Inequalities are exploding. And our planet is burning. People are hurting with the most vulnerable suffering the most. The United Nations Charter and the ideals it represents are in jeopardy. We have a duty to act, and yet we are gridlocked in colossal global dysfunction. The international community is not ready or willing to tackle the big dramatic challenges of our age. This crisis threatens the very future of humanity and the fate of our planet. Crises like the war in Ukraine and the multiplication of conflicts around the globe, climates like the climate emergency and biodiversity loss, Crises like the dire financial situation of developing countries and the fate of the Sustainable Development Goals. And crises like the lack of guardrails allowing around promising new technologies to heal disease, connect people, and expand opportunity. In just the time since I became Secretary General, a tool has been developed to edit genes. Neurotechnology, connecting technology with the human nervous system has progressed from idea to proof of concept. Cryptocurrencies and other blockchain technologies are widespread, but across a host of new technologies, there is a forest of red flags. Social media platforms, based on a business model that monetizes outrage, anger, and negativity, are causing untold damage to communities and societies. Hate speech, misinformation, and abuse, targeted especially at women and vulnerable groups, are proliferating. Our data is being bought and sold to influence our behavior, while spyware and surveillance are out of control, all with no regard for privacy. Artificial intelligence can compromise the integrity of information systems, the media, and indeed democracy itself. Quantum computing could destroy cybersecurity and increase the risk of malfunctions to complex systems we don't have the beginnings of a global architecture to deal with any of these. Excellencies, progress on these issues and more is being held hostage by geopolitical tensions. Our world is in peril and paralyzed. Geopolitical divides are undermining the work of the Security Council, undermining international law, undermining trust and people's faith in democratic institutions, undermining all forms of international cooperation. We cannot go on like this. Even the various groupings set up outside the multilateral system by some members of the international community have fallen into the trap of geopolitical divides like in the G20. At one stage, international relations seem to be moving towards a G2 world. 
now we risk ending up with a G nothing. No cooperation, no dialogue, no collective problem solving. But the reality is that we live in a world where the logic of cooperation and dialogue is the only path forward. No power or group alone can call the shots. No major global challenge can be solved with a coalition of the willing. We need a coalition of the world. Excellence, aujourd'hui. Excellencies, today I want to outline three areas where the coalition of the world must urgently overcome divisions and act together. It starts with a core mission of the United Nations, achieving and sustaining peace. Much of the world's attention remains focused on the Russian invasion of Ukraine. The war has unleashed widespread destruction with massive violations of human rights and international humanitarian law. The latest reports on burial sites in Izium are extremely disturbing. The fighting has claimed thousands of lives, millions have been displaced, billions across the world are affected. We are seeing the threat of dangerous divisions between West and South. The risks to global peace and security are immense. We must keep working for peace in line with the United Nations Charter and international law. At the same time, conflicts and humanitarian crises are spreading often far from the spotlight. The funding gap for a global humanitarian appeal stands at $32 billion, the widest gap ever. Upheaval abounds. In Afghanistan, the economy is in ruins. Over half of all Afghans face extreme levels of hunger, while human rights, particularly the rights of women and girls, are being trampled. In the Democratic Republic of the Congo, armed groups in the east are terrorizing civilians and inflaming regional tensions. In the Horn of Africa, an unprecedented drought is threatening the lives and livelihoods of 22 million people. In Ethiopia, fighting has resumed, underscoring the need for the parties to immediately cease hostilities and return to the peace table. In Haiti, Gangs are destroying the very building blocks of society. In Libya, divisions continue to jeopardize the country. In Iraq, divisions, uh, or rather ongoing tensions, threaten stability. In Israel and Palestine, cycles of violence under the occupation continue as prospects for peace based on a two-state solution grow ever more distant. In Myanmar, the appalling humanitarian, human rights, and security situation is deteriorating by the day. In the Sahel, alarming levels of insecurity and terrorist activity amidst rising humanitarian needs continue to grow. In Syria, violence and hardship still prevail. The list goes on. Meanwhile, nuclear saber-rattling and threats to the safety of nuclear plants are adding to global instability. The review conference of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty failed to reach consensus and a nuclear deal with Iran remains elusive. But there are some glimmers of hope. In Yemen, the nationwide trade truce is fragile but holding. In Colombia, the peace process is taking root. We need much more concerted action everywhere anchored in respect for international law and the protection of human rights. In this splintering world, we need to create mechanisms of dialogue and mediation to heal divides. This is why I outlined elements of a new agenda for peace in my report on our common agenda. We are committed to make the most of every diplomatic tool for the Pacific settlement of disputes as set out in the United Nations Charter. Negotiation, inquiry, mediation, conciliation, arbitration, and judicial settlement. Excellencies, women's leadership and participation 
must be front and center, and we all must, must also prioritize prevention and peace building. That means strengthening strategic foresight, anticipating flashpoints that could erupt into violence, and tackling emerging threats posed by cyber warfare and lethal autonomous weapons. It means also expanding the role of regional groups, strengthening peacekeeping, intensifying disarmament and nonproliferation, preventing and countering terrorism, and ensuring accountability. And it means recognizing human rights as pivotal for prevention. My call to action on human rights highlights the centrality of human rights, refugee, and humanitarian law. In all we do, we must recognize that human rights are the path to resolving tensions, ending conflict, and for forging lasting peace. Excellencies, there is another battle we must end, our suicidal war against nature. The climate crisis is the defining issue of our time, and it must be the first priority of every government and multilateral organization. And yet, climate, check, climate is action is being put on the back burner, despite overwhelming public support around the world. Global greenhouse gas emissions need to be slashed by 45% by 2030 to have any hope of reaching net zero emissions by 2050. And yet emissions are going up at record levels on course to a 14% increase this decade. We have a rendezvous with climate disaster. I recently saw it with my own eyes in Pakistan, where one third of the country is submerged by a monsoon on steroids. We see it everywhere. Planet Earth is a victim of scorched Earth policies. The past year has brought us Europe's worst heat wave since the Middle Ages. Mega drought in China, the United States and beyond. Famine stalking the Horn of Africa. One million species at risk of extinction. No region is untouched. And we ain't seen nothing yet. The hottest summers of today may be the coolest summers of tomorrow. Once in a lifetime climate shocks may soon become once a year events. And with every climate disaster, we know that women and girls are the most affected. The climate crisis is a case study in moral and economic injustice. The G20 emits 80% of all greenhouse gas emissions. But the poorest and most vulnerable, those who contributed least to this crisis, are bearing its most brutal impacts. Meanwhile, the fossil fuel industry is feasting on hundreds of billions of dollars in subsidies and windfall profits, while households' budgets shrink and our planet burns. Excellencies, let's tell it like it is. Our world is addicted to fossil fuels, and it's time for an intervention. We need to hold fossil fuel companies and their enablers to account. And that includes the banks, private equity, asset managers, and other financial institutions that continue to invest and underwrite carbon pollution. It includes the massive public relations machine raking in billions to shield the fossil fuel industry from scrutiny. Just as they did for the tobacco industry decades before, lobbyists and spin doctors have spewed harmful misinformation. Fossil fuel interests need to spend less time averting a PR disaster and more time averting a planetary one. Of course, fossil fuels cannot be shut down overnight. A just transition means leaving no person or country behind. But it's high time to put fossil fuel producers, investors and enablers on notice. Polluters must pay. And today I'm calling on all developed economies to tax the windfall profits of fossil fuel companies. Those funds should be redirected in two ways, to countries suffering loss and damage caused by the climate crisis and to people struggling with rising food and energy prices. As you word to the COP27 UN climate conference in Egypt, I appeal to all leaders to realize the goals of the Paris Agreement. Lift your climate ambition. Listen to your people's calls for change. 
invest in solutions that lead to sustainable economic growth. And let me point to three. First, renewable energy. It generates three times more jobs. It's already cheaper than fossil fuels, and it's the best way to energy security, stable prices, and new industries. But developing countries need help to make this shift, including through international coalitions to support just energy transitions in key emerging economies. Second, helping countries adapt to worsening climate shocks. Resilience building in developing countries is a smart investment in a reliable supply chains, regional stability, and orderly migration. Last year in Glasgow, developed countries agreed to double adaptation funding by 2025. These must be delivered in full as a starting point. At minimum, adaptation must make up half of all climate finance. And multilateral development banks must step up and deliver. Major economies are their shareholders and must make it happen. Third, addressing loss and damage for disasters. It's high time to move beyond endless discussions. Vulnerable countries need meaningful action. Loss and damage are happening now, hurting people and economies now, and must be addressed now, starting at COP27. This is a fundamental question of climate justice, international solidarity, and trust. And at the same time, we must make sure that every person, community and nation, has access to effective early warning systems within the next five years. And we must address the biodiversity crisis by making the December UN Biodiversity Conference a success. The world must agree on a post-2020 global biodiversity framework, one that sets ambitious targets to halt and reverse biodiversity loss provides adequate financing, and eliminates harmful subsidies that destroy ecosystems on which we all depend. And I also urge you to intensify efforts to finalize an international legally binding agreement to conserve and sustainably use marine, mar marine the biological diversity. We must protect the ocean now and for the future. Excellencies, the climate crisis is coming on top of other heavy weather. A once-in-a-generation global cost-of-living crisis is unfolding, turbocharged by the war in Ukraine. Some 94 countries, home to 1.6 billion people, many in Africa, face a perfect storm. Economic and social fallout from the pandemic, soaring food and energy prices, crashing debt burdens, spiraling inflation, and the lack of access to finance. These cascading crises are feeding on each other, compounding inequalities, creating devastating hardship, delaying the energy transition, and threatening global financial meltdown. Social unrest is inevitable, with conflict not far behind. And it doesn't have to be this way. A world without extreme poverty, want or hunger, is not an impossible dream. It is within reach. This is the world envisaged by the 2030 Agenda and the Sustainable Development Goals. But it is not the world we seem to have chosen. Because of our collective decisions, sustainable development everywhere is at risk. The SDGs are issuing an SOS. Even the most fundamental goals on poverty, hunger, and education are going into reverse. More people are poor, more people are hungry, more people are being denied health care and education. Gender equality is going backwards, and women's lives are getting worse, from poverty to choices around sexual and reproductive health to their personal security. Excellencies, developing countries are getting hit from all sides, and we need concerted action. Today, I'm calling for the launch of an SDG stimulus led by the G20 to massively boost sustainable development for developing countries. The upcoming G20 summit in Bali is the place to start. This SDG stimulus has four components. First, multilateral development banks, the World Bank and regional counterparts must increase concessional funding to developing countries linked to investments in the Sustainable Development Goals. And the banks themselves need more finance immediately. 
and then they need to lift their borrowing conditions and increase their appetite for risk so the funds reach all countries in need. Developing countries, particularly small island developing states, face too many obstacles in accessing the finance they need to invest in their people and their future. Second, debt relief. The debt service suspension initiative should be extended and enhanced. But we also need an effective mechanism of debt relief for developing countries, including middle-income countries, in debt distress. Creditors should consider debt reduction mechanisms, such as debt climate adaptation swaps. And this could have saved lives and livelihoods in Pakistan, which is drowning not only in flood water, but in debt. Lending criteria should go beyond gross domestic product and include all the dimensions of vulnerability that affect developing countries. Third, an expansion of liquidity. I urge the International Monetary Fund and major central banks to expand their liquidity facilities and currency lines immediately and significantly. Special drawing rights play an important role in, in enabling developing countries to invest in recovery and the SDGs. But they were distributed according to existing quotas, benefiting those who need them least. We have been waiting for a reallocation for 19 months, and the amounts we hear about are minimal. A new allocation of special drawing rights must be handled differently, based on justice and solidarity with developing countries. Fourth, I call on governments to empower specialized funds like Gavi, the Global Fund, and the Green Climate Fund. G20 economies should underwrite an expansion of these funds as additional financing for the SDGs. Excellencies, let me be clear. The SDG stimulus I'm proposing is essential, but it is only an interim measure. Today's global financial system was created by rich countries to serve their interests many decades ago. It expands and entrenches inequalities. It requires deep structural reform. And my report on our common agenda proposes a new global deal to rebalance power and resources between developed and developing countries. African countries in particular are rendered represented in global institutions. I hope member states will seize the opportunity to turn these ideas into concrete solutions, including at the Summit of the Future in 2024. Excellencies, the divergence between developed and developing countries, between North and South, between the privileged and the rest, is becoming more dangerous by the day. It is at the root of geopolitical tensions and lack of trust that poison every area of global cooperation from vaccines to sanctions to trade. But by acting as one, we can nurture fragile shoots of hope. The hope found in climate and peace activists around the world, calling out for change and demanding better of their leaders. The hope found in young people working every day for a better, more peaceful future. The hope found in women and girls living and fighting for those still being denied their basic human rights. The hope found throughout civil society seeking ways to build more just and equal communities and countries. And the hope found in science and academia racing to stay ahead of deadly diseases and then the COVID-19 pandemic. The hope found in humanitarian heroes rushing to deliver life-saving aid around the world. The United Nations stands with them all. We know lofty ideals must be made real in people's lives so let's develop common solutions to common problems, grounded in goodwill, trust, and the rights shared by every human being. Let's work as one, a coalition of the world, as United Nations. Thank you.